on this episode, I'm talking to Trevor Watkins. Trevor is the ultimate deal maker in the world of sport business. He's the global head of sport with Pinsent Masons with over 30 years of global experience, particularly in the US, working with funders, leagues, teams, and their owners. His experience includes having been a director and chairman of AFC Bournemouth and a divisional board member of the English Football League. I'd love to know what his dream sport business deal would be. I'm really looking forward to talking with Trevor. Trevor, welcome. Thank you. Tell me, who is Trevor Watkins? Lawyer, entrepreneur, father, warrior. Warrior or warrior? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> both, actually. Could be both. And devout AFC Bournemouth fan. Yeah. Uh, five things, I think, sums me up. Yeah, I'd say so. What did you want to be when you were actually growing up? Good question. Terribly insecure when I was growing up. Probably to be liked. That's what I wanted to be. Um, I probably the roots back to when I was adopted. I know we may touch on that. But in truth, an English teacher. Never a lawyer. But then I failed to get an <laughs> offer from university. So um, and my grades ended up being as good as they were supposed to be. So I thought maybe I should do law instead. Interesting. So from English teacher to lawyer, what was the, what was the transition there? What was the progress? Well, it was simply... I was at Bournemouth Grammar School, yeah. doing three level, A levels, two S levels, being told I was going to get high grades, applying to do English because I ran the Drama Society, I ran the Christian Fellowship, played loads of sports, was, was pretty academic, yeah. which an unusual combination, and then finding that I didn't get offered a place, which was completely bamboozled me. Then got high grades, apart from my maths, but I got high grades, got the two S levels, and the head teacher said, you should be going to Oxford or Cambridge. And I thought, well, maybe I don't want to do English. Maybe that's not going to be so useful. So yeah. I thought I'd do law. Did law. That gave me a year off. And then a friend of mine who'd failed his A-levels said, do you want to come and work with me at the BBC for a year? And I ended up having my own radio show. So it was really quite an amazing turn of facts. And I ended yeah. up going to university, did law, thought, well, I should probably train to be a lawyer. Did that. Well, I should qualify. So I did my training qualified. Thought I might as well stay with this because it pays quite well. Yeah. Um, and I did, but I always harboured the uh, desire to be an English teacher because I like working with children, helping people, and it, it really would be very rewarding for me, but uh, law's not been too bad. No, you've done very well. It's interesting because actually a failure to not achieve what you wanted actually diverted you to then do something, that, and some good advice as well, took you to actually into the legal side. I find it interesting because failure is talked about a lot now, and failure leads to success mm. and whatever you choose to sort of quote failure. You've actually paralleled that. Yeah, and I think if you look at failure, um, what, what does that actually mean? I mean, I, I didn't get my position to go and read English at university. Because of that, I tried to read law. Because of that, um, I did read law at Reading. Sure. Um, but I also had that job with the BBC. Yeah. And that connection played out 12 years later in my, my, my rescue of AFC Bournemouth. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. I mean, you were... You were Sports Personality of the Year in the Southern Region. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, there's people that will always remember your name for what you did. Yeah, How did that think, actually happen? <clears throat> I think that was a stitch up, to be honest. But um, <laughs> I was working in London for a, a large, which is now a large American law firm. I'd fallen into doing litigation work, you know, disputes where people mm. sue each other, and I, most of my work was for big insurers who would insure professionals who got sued, and that was going really well. And my boss at the time was a devout, my guy called Michael Robin, devout Tottenham Hotspur fan. And there were four of us. And he'd been great, very pioneering, very successful. We'd been bought by this large American firm. But, you know, I carried on watching Bournemouth play. My dad had taken me when I was seven or eight years old. Yeah. We played Warsaw at home, 1-1-0. It was a whole horrible grey day, I remember that. And I'd gone every week since, as much as I could. And so when the club got into financial trouble, January 97... So just 30 years old, I said to the commercial director in this, what, what was the, the biggest, best, pretty horrible, um, canteen area below the main stand where we, as vice presidents, could go at half time to get a cup of tea. Do you want some help? He said, yes, we'd love some help. I said, I'm a lawyer in the city, I'm a fan. And about 10 days later, he called me back and said, why don't you come to a meeting tomorrow night, Tuesday night, what, the club? No, no, no. Niverton Road, red light area of Bournemouth, so I told. Um, Two-star hotel, driving rain. 
I meet this Australian guy, Roy Pack. He's been brought in by the two remaining directors to try and save their bacon. They had personal guarantees to the bank. Right. So he just said, forget about this, Trev. The, the bank doesn't get the money. And it, it, he had some points, but for the most part, barking mad in, in many senses. Three days later, the bank shut the club. They had, this guy rang me. He said, will you come to a meeting Saturday morning? I said, well, yeah, OK. So I went up to the football club this time. There was a meeting between Arthur Anderson representing Lloyds Bank, who had now been put in as receivers. They'd shut the club. That afternoon, they were playing at Bristol City, touted as the last game ever in the club's history. And I eventually got called into a meeting. Two directors sitting there, Brian Willis, Norman Hayward, this guy, Royston Pack, and Arthur Anderson. And they were arguing. They were arguing about money. And the league, the Football League, had said, it's the middle of a season, this is very inconvenient. They hadn't really had to deal with this before. Um, we want the money to complete the season by next Wednesday or we're going to kick you out. The club was losing 100, 150,000 a month. So the league said, show us you've got 600,000 pounds, you can carry on playing. Banks said, we're not putting it in. Directors, we're not putting it in. <laughs> you want to help Trevor? Why don't you put the money in? Not got a mortgage, got a job. I'm playing football that afternoon. I ring a friend of mine, the same friend I'd had the radio show with 12 years earlier. He's now BBC sports editor. He says, come on the show, I go on the show, tell him what we need to do. People start knowing my name. Probably the first ever crowdfunding, I'd yeah. imagine. Anyway. I remember it, I was living in Bournemouth at the time. Well, you know, I took the day off work on the Tuesday. The, the town gave me the winter gardens to use for the evening. Mm -hmm. We got buckets, um, we collected about 40,000 pounds and then realised the bank was shut, so we had to all sleep in the forest and put it down a track for the night. <laughs> but six months later, we kept that dream alive. We did it because we were passionate about the club. Yeah. There were five or six of us that ran it, a trust fund that we created, and other people came forward. You know, someone came forward the next day after the uh, Winter Gardens and said, I've got £100,000 I'm going to give you. The Times came into my office that day and said, we're going to make you our face of sport because what you're doing is amazing. Right? And suddenly these things started happening. Uh, about 8,201 people turned up and oh, yeah. showed that the town cared about its club. Yes. Eventually the bank said to me, we're going to sell you the club. I said, why? Because we believe you're the best future yeah. for yeah. it. So they effectively lent me two and a half million quid. I bought the, well, we bought the club through a different structure we created and I became chairman. Yeah. And I ran it in my spare time for five years. We built the stadium we play in now. Um, my boss, at the time, Michael, after about a year when we got to win, auto windscreens final at Wembley, said, Trevor, I think uh, time's come for you to either be a lawyer or be chairman of the club. Yeah. He said, if I were you, I'd leave and be chairman of the club. I thought, oh, crikey. Um, no such thing as sports lawyers, no such thing as sports advisors at that time. He said, I think you'll make a success of it. He was right. I didn't see that. So my failure was I lost my job. I moved to Bournemouth. I took a job with a much smaller law firm, that wasn't a success. I wasn't right for them, they weren't right for me. In fact, the two people that hired me, one of them had cleared off and gone and worked for another firm by the time I got there, and he was the one I really liked. Oh, um, you learned so, a lot about business in all of that, though. I learned a lot. A huge amount. You know, I'd won an award at school for organising um, a charity pop concert. Mm. So I won the priority prize for uh, entrepreneurship and innovation uh, when I was at school. So I knew within me there'd always there's something, but this, this was a tremendous opportunity, yeah. and it shaped my life. It yeah. shaped my life ever since. Yeah. And actually, it shaped AFC Bournemouth, you know, Premiership now. I mean, could, would they really be there if that whole story and that had, hadn't happened? They could have gone very much the other way. Yeah, and football's, football's funny. Things get forgotten very quickly. Mm. But there's a lot of self-interest in football, in mean, most businesses. And people keep saying, well, Trevor, well, shouldn't there be a statue of you outside? I said, I said at the end, I said, I think it's quite funny if there was. Um, but generally and genuinely, that wouldn't get anybody very far. I mean, I wrote a book called Cherries in the Red, which is still available, um, because I went into a bookshop one day and decided, oh, maybe people would like to know a bit about this story. Sure. And I did that, not for me, although I ended up going around the world and doing interviews about it, but because I wanted to show what a town could do, what yes. a fan base could do. Yes. A community could do to change the way the world is. So yeah, it, it would have it would it have gone bust. 
I'm sure somebody would have bought it. Yeah, but I think a different story, a different, potentially different outcome. And there's so much in what you just said. There's, there's the passion from yourself mm -hmm. as a fan, let alone u utilizing your business you know, mm -hmm. experience at the time uh, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's the fans themselves, the passion, the desire to save the club. Just fast forwarding to right now with the big money being pumped in from particularly abroad into the UK clubs and what's going on with Qatar, where there is no fan base, there is no grassroots football. What do you think about where the actual game, specifically football, is going? Well, let's and let's, the rest of it's golf as well, right? Other sport. Yeah, but let's look at Bournemouth then for a second. Um, Bill Foley. Mm -hmm. um, I was rung July 2022. I was in Boston at the time. I'd been in Vegas a few days before, ironically. Peter Sadowski, who's Bill's lawyer, He's a great guy. I mean, they're all great guys, actually, really. He rang me having been given my name by somebody in Monaco, of all places, and that's another story, mm -hmm. and started telling me about a vision they had to buy a particular football club. And it, it, I remember him saying, you've probably never heard of it. It's called Bournemouth. I said, and <laughs> so he didn't know your backstory at all then? And it was the funniest thing. And we ended up, and I spoke to Bill that day numerous times, so I had the privilege of getting to know people with big money that wanted to transform the football club I'd watched most of my life. And I've been a season ticket holder every year. A principle we established was I've, we've always all paid for our tickets, never taken anything out. It has helped life, it's made life, it's made my, my career. But a firm belief that everybody pays their way. So I've seen that club come full circle. And I, a good friend of mine, Peak Six from Chicago, when Bournemouth told me in 2016 they needed money, they wanted an investor, I introduced them to Peak Six. And in they came, they bought 25%, and then they exited in due course. So I've seen a number of different cycles of investment. Mm. And whether it's Peter Phillips, who was chairman, or um, whether it's Bill Foley, uh, Eddie Mitchell, who's a property developer, Norman Hayward, whoever it's been, the common thread is everyone has believed in doing it because they believe in the club and the good the club mm. can bring. We all have different styles. People would disagree with what we've done, or, or, or fully back us. But everybody's done it for the same good reasons. So what about, me mentioning the Qatar yes. scenario, what, where do you think that's going? Because that's, there's no fan base, there's no, it, it's selling shirts and it's amassing a dream team, but is that really, you know, what, you know, that's not for me the passion behind but, the football. But that, that, but you're talking about ownership. Mm. So in the Premier League, there's five clubs that are owned by English people. Does it really matter where people come from? Ultimately, why, what, these days, you're not going to get a bucket fund saving a Premier League club. You wouldn't have had that actually in 97. Mm. And I think the amount we raised would buy three months' wages of one player in the Premier League, probably, <laughs> um, let alone anything else. So I don't think ownership and the nationality of an owner matters. I think respect for the heritage, mm. for the fans. Whether you're Qatari, Saudi Arabian, Thai, American, English, you have a fan base and it's always been the same in the 1970s where it's the traditional english businessman done well sure looks after his club you've still got a diverse fan base drawn from across a community yes it's been gentrified there's a lot more prawn sandwiches as roy Keane would say but ultimately it's the same so it's being respectful look at what the saudi arabians have done with newcastle they've gone out and picked the best talent on and off the field mm. I mean, Eddie Howe I signed for seven years when he was a Bournemouth player. And he was him and Steve Fletcher, and a chap called John Bailey. They were the three players that were there all the time supporting because they cared. Mm. And so I think that there's a kind of a misnomer. I think the money coming into the game is reflective of how amazingly valuable sport is as a live commodity. I'd agree with that. And people yeah. are investing across the board. Mm. And, you know, we've got Pins and Masons, and we've just devised on the Everton deal. We advised the buyers of Burnley. We advised Plymouth on a sale of a stake. I'm working with two championship clubs on a potential sale. We are talking probably to half the Premier League about various bits and pieces. Mm. We look after a lot of Liverpool's work, Manchester City, Everton, Fulham. Great clients to work with, brilliant people. Mm. All, again, people are very experienced and we're very lucky to be able to do so. Sure. Um, but ultimately, why do they need us as advisors? I mean, we have a fairly unique team given and there's not many people who are ex-chairman of clubs. I, mean, I was on the board of the English Football League as well. And my team is made up of people, a lot of whom are immersed in the industry. Sure. But we are there because the sector, 
generates the revenue that requires the advice that we can give. There's a, there's a lot of deals you'll end up working on mm. that, dare I say, no one ever hears about. Mm. Let down at the last minute, something falls Vast apart. Vast majority. The, really. Vast majority fall by the wayside. What do you learn from those? The psychology, mm. the way people are. You, know, you and I have chatted many a time about mental health, the way in which people think, mm. being sensitive to what they're susceptible to. Um, I can't stop the owner of a championship club deciding at two minutes to five after four months' work that they don't just want to sell this club to my clients with the money in the bank ready to pay them. But that happens. We can't stop what I think was the... I mean, a lot of respect for Todd Bowley. I mean, he, had, you know, he gets criticised a lot in the media, but he's got a plan and he's sticking to it. Mm. And let's see where Chelsea end up because he's invested. They've invested a lot of people's money in the future of that club. We sure. were representing one of the other buyers that was shortlisted. And I think that was a great shame because the uh, Chicago Cubs and Tom Ricketts, their, their bid, they'd spent a huge amount of time over four years on that club. And they would have been great owners. But somebody else played a PR game, which meant that that bid got tarnished, which was a great shame. So you see, we see these things derailed, not because of the people involved, but because of external influences. Politics. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned mental health. Mm. We're filming in the Jack, J-A-A-Q, yeah. just to ask a question, social media mental health platform. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on Jack? Well, having had, again, the benefit of speaking to the founder and looking at it, I think, yeah, Mindful Business Charter, neurodiversity, mental health is something that you know, Pinson Masons have been very much at uh, uh, the, the forefront of. Mm. And I adopted, uh, we adopted two girls and what I've learned from seeing what they've been through, the trauma, has given me an eye into things that I didn't have an eye into before, about the effect of before you're born, how it shapes your life. What age were they when you adopted them? Um, they, they were in their, their early years. Okay. But they, they, they'd been in care quite some time. Yeah. And I was adopted myself, actually. I was born to a 17-year-old mother who already had a two-year-old son who gave birth to me in London when she lived, the family lived nowhere near there. So, and yeah, sadly, she died before I could find out more. But talking to the, that family, you know, they, they didn't know anything about me. So I can, I can see now how my life has been shaped by things that we now talk about a lot more. So something like Jack, which gives people access to information about mental health. No pressure, the, the ability to actually tap into and hear people's stories, mm. to learn without saying, oh, I need to get signed up to the National Health Service to get a CAMS appointment two and a half years from now to get my son or daughter treated. This is some sort of diagnosis and here's some medication. Yeah. This really pushes that needle forward and gives people something that I think is, is tremendously useful. And it's something that you know, we as a business incredibly alive to. Andrew Masraf, who's our senior partner, um, he and I have spoken about social infrastructure, the importance of society, the importance of those links, those bonds, and how we help people, mm. including ourselves. And that, so I think Danny obviously founded Jack. He's really hit on something, and it is so important because we've all, we're all different. Totally. Our brains all work in different ways, and we, we, we've, we have not given that the attention we should have done. No. Talking about giving ourselves the attention we should do. Mm. We've all got different ways of keeping ourselves mentally and physically fit. There's so many ways of doing it, from having a cold shower to <laughs> breathing exercises to going for a good old-fashioned run. What works for you? Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I like to keep busy. I probably don't relax as much as I should do. Yeah. I tell you what, football, playing football. The advent, the advent of seeing... Um, now, it, it, they say it's walking football, but it isn't. Mm. If you ask the guys who play at Red Lynch on a Monday lunchtime. Because the pandemic, I mean, there's some lot of bad things coming out of that. But I was looking for a way to communicate with my team globally. Mm. And suddenly, where did Microsoft Teams come from? Or Zoom? Who would have thought it? I, I had never heard of it before, which probably makes me <laughs> mean the minority, but I had never heard of it No, before. neither had I. I didn't need it. No. And Every meeting was a meeting. So suddenly, transformed life. But it also meant is a bit more ability to work from home. So I can talk to offices around the world. I saw this sign up, it said, walking football, Monday lunchtime, one to two. It, it's actually great fun. 
and not quite walking. Mm. But um, so that tennis um, learning, I think you know the amazing thing is you can learn so much every day, and yeah. and, and the importance of our communities and our friendships. Family, yep. the way in which we are all bound together. Socialising. Yeah. Because, because that's think, obviously what really was missing in, in the actual form of socialising in, in uh, the pandemic. And uh, you can see the effect now. Mm. And you can see the way in which it's knocking on with a, a lot of children, which is mm. very sad indeed. There's a lot that you've spoken about that's both personal and, and sort of business related, but how would you define success? Success is really, a, I think a lot of it comes from are you comfortable in yourself? Are you comfortable with yourself? I, I, mean, I said, you asked me what I was at the beginning, and one of the things I said was worrier. I can remember moments from primary school. What, was I going to be picked for a team, not picked for a team? Um, striving to get success by external references. I mean, the reason I got BBC Sports Personality of the Year for the South was simply because that year the BBC decided to have four regional awards and a national one, but they made it a public vote. At that time, with very little social media, the Bournemouth fans all nominated me. So, you know, the lady who got a gold medal at judo at the World Championships, Roger Black having got a silver medal at the Olympics, I feel very sorry for them. Because it was I, a moment I in time there, right? It was, it was a moment in time. And, it, 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 you know, and I'm very proud of that because yeah. it's a great story and it meant a lot to me and hopefully meant a lot to the town. But when you're looking at success, I remember a boss rang me and said, Trevor, why are you worrying? I said, well, we, what work are we going to get? We're going to do this, we're going to do this. He said, have you ever not been busy? I said, no. He said, so you're doing something right. He said, just carry on doing it. Mm. Remember that, that was great advice. And so for me, success is about giving your all, working hard, and whether you win a bid, you know, or fail, you can look at it and say, I did it the right way. I followed my integrity. I did it to the best of my ability and I supported my team. And that, that's success. It isn't necessarily about whether you're you know, two nil up <laughs> and, and, you, and you win a match because yeah. then you worry about paying the win bonus. Um, <laughs> maybe not so much when you've got the three points. Yeah. So success and failure are both things you learn a lot from. Mm. And it's that continual process of looking back, reflecting, and looking forward, I think, is, is what really makes it yeah. the positive. Yeah, you've articulated that really well. Now, thank you, Trevor. You've talked really openly about yourself and about some, some of the big deals you've worked on and probably mm. still working on. Uh, I found it really interesting. So, yeah, thank you so much for talking to me today. No pleasure, and thanks for the opportunity. I think that if anybody's you know, listening and has gone through that process, you know, it, it's vital to be able to talk to people and have the kind of resources. Yeah. Because, you know, business, at the end of the day, yeah, pays the mortgage. It, and I get a lot of satisfaction from it. And, it, and who wouldn't want to work in sport media entertainment? You know, the girl's got to um, have dinner with Will I Am once as a result of a charity lot auction. And he was the most amazing person, by the way. Um, we've been to some great events. We've made some great friends. Yeah. And you top people like Nevin Shrewsdale, who runs the Jockey Club, um, Alistair McIntosh running Fulham, Katie Charles is at Everton, Julian is one of anyone my colleagues. You meet all these characters, yeah. they've all got stories. Yeah, and you're learning from them. And right? you're learning all the time and having great fun. So, yeah. you know, my life's given me a huge amount, so I should, can't yeah. really complain. I can tell that you enjoy the, the, the balance of work as well as actually enjoying it. The people you clearly do the deals with, your colleagues, bringing your family in, it's a, it's a good combination well, no, of work-life balance. Yeah, my, my 11-year-old said to me just last night, right, you've known me 10 years, Daddy, so this is the proportion of your life. You need to dedicate that on this interview tomorrow. So, but that's the funny thing. They bring you down to earth. And yeah. they see me on television, they hear me on the radio, mm. and I get to lead this strange life of you know, walking the pit lane in Monaco just because it happens that I was nice to someone 12 years earlier whose yeah. son now works for, in that case, Ferrari, and I get to do amazing things, and we have great chats like this. And yeah. Hopefully, yeah, legacy will be that it's made a difference to some people. Yeah. And probably the last thing I'll mention is, I remember going into Tesco shopping one Tuesday afternoon, when two people came up to me and said, well, Mr. Watkins, do you mind if we have a word? I said, oh, it's 
I just wanted to thank you for saving the football club. And I said, Mike, well, I do believe, well, it's actually a lot more of us than just me, but I was yeah. the figurehead. They said, well, it means the world to us because we use all our holiday to go and watch the team play. We use all our money to follow the team. It's their life. It's their life. It revolves around it. And yeah. although I knew it was important, I didn't realise how yeah. far it went. And that's why sport, entertainment, all these sort of things mm. make such a difference and why I enjoy what I do yeah. and why I carry on doing it. Well, I can tell. Now you've been really open. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.